All righty. It is 11 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us for this pavement uh, town hall. We'll be answering questions that many of you have submitted ahead of time, as well as a few questions that we came up with um, as our most commonly asked questions, as well as questions you might ask us during this town hall. Before I introduce the panelists, I would like to take a moment to quickly introduce Benchmark. And down at the bottom, you will see a QR code. If you put your phone on camera mode and hold it up, it should take you right to our LinkedIn page. We'd love for you to connect with us. Benchmark is a roof and pavement consulting company with a, about 115 employees with uh, two offices, one in Cedar Rapids and one in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Many of our consultants are located across the United States. And uh, yeah, that's just a little bit about us. We have four panelists with us today. We have Elise Schmidt, who is the general manager and a partner with Benchmark. She is involved with many of our projects. And once again, we do have QR codes across the bottom for you to connect with each of the panelists. Jason Brazer is a senior consultant, partner, and PE on our pavement team. Next, we have Troy Kaiser, a senior consultant. And finally, we have Mike Kovach, who is a business development specialist. So as I mentioned, we do have quite a few questions already uh, ready to go, uh, but feel free to use the question and answer portion of Zoom, which is down on the bottom. And if we do not have time to get through all of our questions, we will make sure to follow up with uh, any answers that we may need to provide. And so with that, we will go ahead and get started. And so this first question I am going to give to you, Elise, and they are asking, how often should you inspect your pavement? Well, um, Ben, typically we would say you should inspect your pavements. General rule of thumb is every two to three years, but definitely not a one size fits all for all companies. Um, some of the clients that we work with may have thousands of uh, facilities, and so they may actually inspect their pavements once every five years. Uh, but really what's most important is that initial inspection, and so because that's where what really creates that baseline to help you plan for future expenditures. So once you've created that baseline, somewhere between two and five years, you should re-inspect your pavements. Very good. And you don't really, you don't have to do all, if you've got a large portfolio, you don't have to inspect all your pavements the first year. You could stagger um, every other year and, you know, to keep your, your costs down, your yearly costs down. So don't feel like you need to do them all at one time. It does, certainly doesn't hurt to spread it out over two or three years uh, over your portfolio. Very good. And Troy, actually, as a follow-up to that, so after you've done your assessments and you've determined um, the conditions of all of them. How, during that determination process, how do you determine when a pavement, you know, a parking lot or a road is reaching the end of its service life? Well, obviously cracking is a big factor. Uh, once the cracking gets to a point where crack filling or crack sealing is no longer uh, a viable option or a cost-effective option, uh, then we start looking at uh, overlay or reconstruction options. The big thing I look for is surface deformation in the pavement. I look for rutting, wheel depression, settling. That tells me what's underneath is uh, not supporting uh, the pavement and it's getting very close to uh, needing a reconstruction. So that's the main thing I look for uh, when trying to determine if it's reaching the end of its serviceable life. And so if there's, um, if you identify a pavement that's reaching that end, is there a way to do a reconstruction project without having to do a full replacement? Well, obviously um, we wanna do some uh, ex geotechnical exploration of that uh, pavement first to make sure we have an adequate base underneath. Uh, then we can look at options of removing the pavement and just replacing the pavement without having to do a full depth reconstruction. All right, and Elise, this, this next question will be for you. And they're asking, what is the most economical preventative maintenance item that they can accomplish? 
Sure. So uh, when it comes to your asphalt pavements, what I would say is the most cost effective preventive maintenance item is going to be crack sealing, uh, making sure that it is done right. Uh, in this industry, we hear crack filling and crack sealing. And uh, typically what Benchmark recommends is the crack sealing uh, because the crack sealing actually involves routing out the crack. Mm -hmm. It involves um, cleaning out the crack and um, gives you a nice reservoir for that sealant to go in. And so uh, crack sealing is really the most cost effective uh, maintenance item for asphalt pavements. So kind of to follow up on that a little bit, Elise, you mentioned the reservoir. Um, so I guess people can kind of picture how the router works. It, it creates kind of a, a perfect box, sometimes a three quarter inch or a one inch, depending on the size of the, the width of the crack. And that reservoir allows that material to go into that, and then as that um, pavement expands and contracts, it gives that one-to-one -one ratio, which is the most elongation for that crack fill material. If they just do it with the crack filling and fill in a crack the size of your finger, once that spreads to twice that size, it has pulled that material off of one of the two sides, and it's no longer a viable water seal. So that reservoir is key, and you know it, it, there's an upcharge to do that and additional equipment, but it's well worth the investment to get the long-term um, structural support of that. Absolutely. And Jason, so we're talking about asphalt with the, the um, those repairs. What can you do for a, a concrete pavement? Um, concrete pavement is similar. With the concrete pavement, you've, you've cut the expansion and contraction joints within the pavement itself. No matter what you do, concrete is going to crack. And the best thing for your concrete pavement is to tell it where to crack. So depending on whether you're doing walkways or roadways, a light duty, heavy duty, that spacing is all dependent upon that. Um, there are two ways to do the joints, one of which is a tool joint, the second of which is a saw cut joint, but either way those joints need to be sealed similar to the crack filling that, and crack sealing that Elise was just mentioning, and different product for some of that, but also the same product. So if you envision a saw cut joint in a concrete pavement, they're narrower, typically three eighths of an inch. Um, sometimes if you double cut them, you could be a half inch wide. And that material needs to get installed with a backer rod down at the bottom. You, you put the backer rod in, say three quarters of an inch or so down, and then you fill that with typically the silicone type sealant. Um, if you do a tool joint, it's automatically a little bit wider but that silicone sealant will prevent the water from getting in there. Once the water's into your pavement structure, it saturates the aggregate base, it saturates the subgrade, whether it's asphalt or concrete, and that's ultimately where you're going to fail. Um, the silicone-based sealant has a longer lifespan, but it is a little bit on the pricey side. So for your walkways or maybe your lighter duty car parking lots, things like that, joint sealant with the silicone is an excellent investment. But in a large marshalling yard where you're not as concerned about visual look, you're more concerned about protecting that lower grade, you could use the same material that a crack seal material would be, kind of that black hot rubberized type material. It will do the same thing, it's just not aesthetically pleasing on a gray pavement per se. And so Jason, as a follow-up to that, what is, why is joint spalling in concrete so common and what exactly is happening for that to occur? Um, so joint spalling is a cracking deterioration and typically what you're seeing is that saw cut joint is not sealed or the tool joint is not sealed. Tool joints have a tendency to spall a little bit less because they're kind of curved at the top versus saw cuts are vertical. Um, but typically what's happening, you'll see a lot of the spalling taking place in cooler climates where you're getting kind of a freeze thaw cycle on a regular basis as either the snow melts or you get moisture and saturation into those joints, it then freezes overnight. And as that water expands when it uh, freezes, you end up with the spalling at the surface and more or less causing the damage that way. There is also an opportunity for an incompressible material like pebbles or rocks to get into that joint. And then as that concrete compresses together, it ends up with the incompressible item in there and that will actually cause a spall as well. So not only does joint sealing help you know extend the life of the pavement surface and underneath the aggregate in the um, underlying subgrade but it also prevents spalling from taking place uh, which 
eventually will just get larger and larger and larger and eventually get to the point that you need to do a joint replacement in lieu of full panel replacement. And so, Troy, I'm gonna go ahead and give you this next one. And they're asking about um, scaling. And so first, can you explain the difference between scaling and spalling? And then it, this person, they, it sounds like they have widespread scaling on their, their concrete pavements. Are there any repairs they can do for scaling without doing a full replacement? Well, like Jason mentioned, uh, spalling is a, a cracking issue along the joints. Scaling is a surface issue where the surface of the concrete flakes off uh, much like, and it looks like fish scales, and you lose that uh, uh, hard surface of your concrete. It's caused by too much water at the surface of the concrete, and there's several things that can cause that. Too much water added at the plant when it was mixed, too much water added in the truck uh, while it was being delivered or standing on site waiting to be poured, or the crew itself can add too much water to the surface uh, when they're finishing. Um, and even if they don't add too much water, if they work that surface too much and get that cream coming up to the surface, that'll put too much water on the surface as well. And then what happens is that that surface flakes off in what we call uh, scaling. Uh, for smaller areas like driveways and sidewalks, there really aren't any products out there to repair that. The best thing you can do is just replace that concrete. If you have a larger area, an industrial setting, and uh, we had a project that we had to do this, uh, we actually overlaid it with asphalt to uh, seal the surface of that concrete and make it last uh, a little bit longer and get some more serviceable life out of that concrete. But uh, as far as small areas or uh, residential, I, there just aren't any products out there that'll work for uh, repairing scaling. And Troy, so this question that uh, came in kind of loops back to that question I was asking about um, ways to reconstruct without doing a full replacement. And they're wondering if you can describe the difference between an overlay and a full reconstruction. Well, an, an overlay is just the way it sounds. Um, we actually call them structural overlays. Um, it's pavement that's either, it's asphalt that's put on either an existing asphalt pavement or an existing concrete pavement that actually adds structural value to the pavement system. Um, we've seen overlays that are just kind of slopped over the top of an existing pavement that are very thin. They don't add any structural value. Um, overlays are, are, are a good tool that we have in our, our toolbox, but they need to be done properly and they have to add value to the pavement. Otherwise, you're just wasting your money. So. That's what an overlay is compared to a full reconstruction where you remove the pavement and the base course and start over from scratch. Very well, good. And Thank kind you. of as you mentioned earlier, Troy, there is kind of the in-between of knowing you have good subgrade, you have good aggregate base, but you have the just the bad asphalt on top, that three or four inches. So an overlay would be, you know, one or two inches of new asphalt and a partial depth could be just removing that concrete, but then full depth would be removing the asphalt, the aggregate base, and kind of starting over. So um, keys to getting everything right. There's a lot of different costs and a lot of different needs. So it's important to know what exactly that site needs and requires so that you don't waste good money by putting an overlay over a failed subgrade per se. So Elise, in the same kind of line of thought as we were earlier on um, preventative maintenance, what other types of preventive maintenance items should a facility be looking into? Sure, so um, outside of the crack sealing operation, some of the other maintenance items that we typically see the need for when we're out doing assessments is uh, asphalt pavement restoration. So spot repairs, maybe there's potholes or other things that need to be fixed. Uh, also some sidewalk or concrete slab replacements, especially like in the front of um, retail stores, making sure that there's no safety issues. And then it's also really important to take care of any spot curb repairs. So especially if you're in a northern climate and you um, potentially have snowplow damage, you wanna make sure that you take care of those curb repairs. And then also you don't wanna forget about your drainage structure and utility structure repairs because those are critical uh, to maintaining your asphalt pavements. And so Elise, 
one thing that Elise mentioned there, Troy, was um, repairing potholes. And so can you describe, you know, what is the best way to repair small and large potholes? Could they go out to the, the Home Improvement Center and buy that bag of, of cold asphalt patch? That's certainly, you can use those kind of materials for a temporary repair. Um, you can have contractors come in with a cold mix that's made at a, a commercial asphalt plant for, for kind of temporary repairs over the winter time in northern climates before the asphalt plants um, open up. The key to these repairs though is proper preparation. You have to make sure that before you put the material in the hole that the, the pothole is cleared of uh, loose debris. Uh, it has to be dry. Uh, probably the most critical step is around the edges you need to cut down the gravel so you have a nice uh, stand up edge along the around the perimeter of the pothole so you have a consistent thickness of this material when it's placed and hand tamp it um, with a, what I like to use a, a, a hand tamper um, but you can use your shovel to kind of push it down, even step on it, make sure it gets packed down in there but the key is those vertical edges. It, the best way to do it is to saw cut around the, the pothole so that uh, you have a nice clean vertical edge. And if you have some tack material, you, you can put it on those edges as well. But the key is a, a nice thickness throughout the pothole and, and making sure you get those edges cut down before you install your material. And then in the spring when the plant opens up, you can have those uh, areas restored, uh, like Elise mentioned, uh, with hot mix the right way. So we got a couple questions here regarding pavement markings. And Elise, I'm gonna give you this first one. How can I make my pavement markings last longer? That's an interesting question. Um, a couple of things that you could do to make your pavement markings last longer. Um, first and foremost is preparation. So making sure that before the parking lot is um, restriped, that you've cleaned it, that it's been swept out, uh, preparation is really key. Also quality paints. There's a number of paints that we specify um, that are high quality that are going to last longer. And then also um, two coats of paint. A lot of times you're only getting one coat of paint if you're not specifying two coats. And if you put that two coats on, your pavement marking is going to last longer. And so with the necessary preparation, a good paint, and um, making sure that you have the two coats of paint, your pavement marking should last between three and five years. So if they're not lasting that long, you may want to consider why um, and look at making some changes. And Jason, so the second question, are there any tricks that, these, that, that you should consider for concrete pavements? Um, yeah, like Elise said, a lot of it comes down to prep and, and quality materials. But when you're doing a concrete pavement, proper industry standards is to put a curing compound on that concrete pavement once it is finished and done. And that curing compound, a lot of times, is a wax-based product, which helps to trap the moisture inside that concrete pavement. So it, it just does what concrete does, does what the cement does through the evaporation process. But that wax-based material is still left on your surface. So prior to putting any sort of pavement marking down on concrete pavements, uh, I did use is etching it. And what an etcher is, is it's a small walk behind type machine about half the size of a standard lawnmower and it's just got a little drum on it and belt and it cleans off that surface and notches yourself down into the existing concrete versus that wax based compound on top and it will also smooth out any of the broom finish that's on that pavement as well so you know once that's taken place then as at least mentioned you have to be dust free it's got to be cleaned back off and everything but Etching is a key to making sure your pavement marking will adhere to concrete. Very good. And this next question um, pivots a little bit from repairs and is looking more of kind of a program approach. And Elise, I'm going to ask this one to you. They have a facility where all of the pavements are needing replacement. However, they only have a budget to replace 25% per year. How should they be prioritizing which pavements get replaced per year? Sure. Uh, so there's a couple of factors that can come into play when you're talking about prioritizing your pavements. Uh, first and foremost, you want to look at safety. Do you have safety issues that need to be taken care of? Sometimes maybe you can do that with some expense money, but you want to be making sure that you're addressing any of the safety areas, specifically if they're in a 
guest facing or a employee facing area that's used. You also wanna look at traffic. So uh, if your entire facility is in rough shape, what is the traffic loads that are coming through? Who's utilizing the pavements? And are they highly used pavements or lower used pavements? And then you also wanna take in, if you know your entire facility is in rough shape, you wanna take into account the construction phasing. So there is a method to the madness a lot of times when um, a consultant is recommending which areas to replace first. And a lot of times um, you want to work from a far side of the facility out so that you're not having construction traffic go over the areas that you just rehabbed the year before. Um, and you also wanna make sure that even though your entire facility might be in bad shape, you might have different types of bad shape, if you will. And so uh, if there's any areas that are actually maybe in that, uh, Troy was talking about a structural overlay before, if there's any pavements that are actually in that condition that a structural overlay uh, would help the pavement, we would typically recommend that you prioritize that structural overlay ahead of your reconstruction. Certainly take care of any safety issues in those areas that need to be reconstructed, uh, but an overlay can save you three to five times the cost of a reconstruction, so you wanna make sure that you're taking the, um, the method into account, the type of repair uh, when you're doing your prioritization as well. I think yeah, kind of to follow up on that a little, Elise, yeah, it's like once you're to the point of a, a full depth reconstruction, that's where you're at. If, you know, the pavement's not gonna, the pavement may get worse, but the repair methodology is going to be the same and it's going to be just as expensive versus spending your money on an overlay. I think that that three pronged approach is really the way to go. Maintain your pavements that are in good shape, spend the money on crack ceiling, even though you feel like you should be spending it on your pavements that are in the worst shape. You don't wanna be a fireman, you don't wanna be chasing uh, your bad pavements. So maintain your good pavements, see if you can do some overlays to extend the life of those pavements, and then do your reconstructions last. Like Jason said, the pavement's not gonna change that much and the cost is not gonna change that much from year to year to redo those pavements. So um, take care of your good pavements first with a, a program of rebuilding your poor pavements but rebuild your poor pavements in the right method so that they do last that 20 years. Um, the worst thing you can do is take your money and spread it out over the whole site, but do it incorrectly. You're just throwing good money after bad. Absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, when it comes to budget cutting, the first thing that goes is, is preventative maintenance. And it has a huge impact on, on the overall value of your, pay, of your pavement asset. Yeah. Absolutely. And Elise, I'm gonna give you this next question as well. And they're looking for a way to manage all of their service history, uh, have easy access to previous reports such as geotechnical surveys, repairs, repair costs, budget assessment, or budget forecasts, and you know their, over, their overall year-to-year -year, uh, cost avoidance methods. So how do you recommend a facility manage all that information? Sure, so, um, you know, Ben, I would really say that a database is key. So there's many different databases out there that you can choose from to help you manage your uh, pavement assets or roof assets. Uh, at Benchmark, we utilize our in-house database called SiteMan. So in our particular database, we do have the ability to house roof information, pavement information, and then also we've had some clients that have asked to add some infrastructure information in there. Uh, but no matter what database you're using, I think one of the most important things, and we talked about this in question one, was that baseline assessment. So you wanna make sure that your database has some sort of condition assessment in it, somewhere where you can understand your overall asset value, uh, that you have an inventory of your different pavements, your locations, really knowing what you have is critical and uh, knowing the condition and the next necessary expenditures from year to year. So a lot of times you're forecasting out five to 10 years. Um, but having the ability in your database to have that baseline condition assessment is really going to help you to be able to query reports and um, run information for budgeting, forecasting, uh, funding approvals, leadership approvals, that type of thing. Uh, it's also important that any database that you use has um, access to store information. So uh, whether you have a portfolio of 15 facilities or 2,000 facilities or more, it's nice to have a one-stop shop where, you know, Ben, you, I think the question asked about geotechnical reports. So you can have a specific facility level where you can put all of the information. So maybe that's the initial construction information, geotechnical reports, it could be recent rehabilitation projects, past cost um, 
for the project, all of that stuff should be able to be housed within your database. So there's definitely many um, advantages to having a database that helps you to proactively track and maintain your pavement assets. Yeah, I think that's, that's so many times, at least, we, we go to a site when we're doing the initial uh, uh, design or evaluation and the construction plans are lost from when it, uh, a pavement was redone. Uh, they're rolled up in some utility room, they get wet, they get thrown away, or a report is done and it sits on somebody's desk, but then when they retire or go to a different job, you know, that folder disappears. So maintaining that information is, is invaluable. Absolutely. And, you know, I think also, Troy, I didn't mention this before, but the ability for you as the owner to have read-write access. So you can go in and upload information that you may have um, or that, you know, whoever's doing your condition, condition assessment can go in and add that information. But I think it's critical that it's a um, user-friendly database that you as the owner have access to updating and um, maintaining as well. All right, this next question uh, I'm gonna to give to you, Mike, and they're asking, how does geography impact the type of pavement that gets installed? Well, first of all, Ben, thank you for including me in the, uh, in the program. Appreciate the, appreciate the question. Um, in spite of geography, so in spite of popular, what might be popular uh, thought, um, geography really doesn't play as much of a role in the impact of deciding pavement type uh, to be placed. Um, uh, what we do as, uh, or what a, a designer will do in looking at uh, the pavement is going to be application, right? Um, classic example, when you, when you look at the two different types of pavements, you have a flexible pavement in, in asphalt and you have a very rigid uh, pavement in, uh, in concrete. Concrete performs very, very well under constant compression and building structures and, and the like there. Asphalt being flexible does very well under repetitive compression. So, you know, roadway, tra uh, traffic, that kind of thing. So when you've got places that you're going to have static loading uh, for long periods of time, like you're, you're maybe staging trucks, uh, trailers being parked, um, where their feet will be sitting and that kind of thing, concrete does, does really well in those instances. Uh, parking lots and, and roadways, asphalt performs performs very well. well. One thing to bring up as well, Mike, is there have been some industrial settings that we've been at, uh, and all of a sudden the program has changed. They, they've either taken a lot and used it as a different utilization, or what was set up for initially 43-foot or 48-foot trailers are now bringing 53-foot trailers. So you get that deformation in the asphalt that's four feet away from the concrete, it was designed and built to meet what they wanted to do 25 years ago. And a lot right. of times that concrete pavement is low use in that dock area, but all you need to do is add 10 feet or add 12 feet out to those kind that exist in concrete to catch those landing gear and make sure that the, the axles on the trucks are lined up there when they're loading and unloading and it'll help extend the life of the existing right. asphalt pavements that's, that's adjacent to it. Right. So, Mike, you mentioned that it, it, geography doesn't really have that big of an impact. Are there any situations where it, it actually does impact? Yeah, you know, um, not so much, but uh, I guess the extreme example would be uh, areas of the United States maybe that um, only has a particular type of uh, material directly available. Um, asphalt's very well at using materials that are closely related to it and, um, and has designs suited for just about, just about every kind of, of aggregates, you know, that are, that are provided throughout our country. Uh, concrete, uh, a little more specific in the quality of the aggregate that needs to go into it. Um, I, the first place that comes to my mind is, is Houston, Texas. Houston uh, has a, a lot of concrete down there simply because they have uh, the, the aggregate type and, and the materials they have available for them uh, in that area. So that's the yeah. And concrete is a little, it's a little easier to set up a portable plant per se, where, you know, a lot of times if you've got a large industrial type project and it's all concrete pavement. It's easier to bring that out, that concrete plant in and set that up to do batch um, type production versus an asphalt plant. Asphalt is, is 
technology is crazy. The plant setup is insane. These, these permanent plants are, are pieces of art when it comes to what they can do and how they do it. But concrete's a little more basic and simple where, you know, you can bring in a portable plant and mix concrete for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and then disappear. Asphalt doesn't operate that same way. So Jason, this next question I'll give to you. And they're asking, are there any ways to bridge over soft uh, subgrade materials? Yes, there are. Um, typically, a lot of your soft subgrade is going to be a more of a clay type material, something that's saturated or wet. So a couple options would be what they call a geotextile fabric. Um, there are multiple types of fabrics, some of which are triaxial, biaxial, which kind of look like an orange snow fence. Um, you know, it's not four foot wide. They're typically 12 or 15 foot wide to cover over these areas. But if you can envision, you know, an exposed subgrade, predominantly, like I said, more of a, a silty or clay type material that's soft, you lay that geogrid over the top of that and those holes all vary in size. And like I said, some of them are shaped like diamonds, some of them are shaped like triangles. And you want larger aggregates, more of the size of, you know, baseball, softball type that will actually lock themselves into that grid. And then that is actually what bridges and supports over that soft area. So it's key to make sure you've got the right material as well as the right aggregate to go on top of that. But then you also need to take it one step further where once you get that bridged in your solid, you now need to go back to the type of crushed aggregate base course that involves more of the fines in it. Something that you would see that the asphalt contractor can, can shape and grade. And you want those fines to stay interlocked with the smaller aggregate, more of the golf ball or smaller size. So you also use the separation fabric, which keeps those fines trapped above that rock that's integrated into the geogrid up into that area. So multi-step process. There's also, depending on the size of the project and your needs, you could do more reclamation or soil stabilization of that wet clay type material. A um, couple different options. You can add cement to it. You can add fly ash to it. You can add kiln dust to it. You can add a uh, um, few other products, but a lot of times that's a very expensive mobilization cost. You've got many pieces of equipment that come in to do that or the lime is not inexpensive, the cement is not inexpensive. So it depends on the size of the project, but there are many solutions versus just digging out two, three, four feet and importing, you know, freshly crushed virgin material. Mike, so this question will be for you. And they're asking, what is pulverization and when should it be used and what are the benefits? Uh, nice segue, Jason. Uh, <laughs> what Jason just got done talking about with the base stabilization is, is uh, akin to pulverization. Pulverizing is taking an existing asphalt pavement uh, that you have there. It's, um, it's, it's spent and it's been deemed that it, it's a good application for pulverizing and basically all we're doing is we're taking a machine in and we're pulverizing it. We're chopping it up and uh, smaller, smaller pieces, as small as we can get them, we're introducing that, blending it in with some of the, the sub-base material. And, um, and that in and of itself uh, helps to stabilize uh, the base and it becomes a stabilized base for a new asphalt surface that you're going to put over, over the top of it. Not all pavements are uh, uh, appropriate for that. Um, uh, some, some are, uh, usually when you've got, uh, a pavement that for the most part has not been maintained, uh, has had a lot of raveling, lots of the block and alligator cracking happening. So there's been a lot of water introduced to the sub base and some of that has failed and washed away, but you still have the asphalt pavement there and the asphalt oil that, that is, that's not oxidized, it's still uh, I always say alive, that's, that's still pliable uh, in the rest of that pavement, can assist in holding and help binding that sub base. So blending it, blending it in and, and utilizing it in a pulverization uh, application is a great way uh, uh, to do that. And the great thing about it is the benefits of it is number one, you, you get a 
uh, a more stabilized base to build off of. Number two, uh, you are in place recycling that investment that you've had there already. So we're not we're not milling it up or grinding it up and putting it in the back of a truck and hauling it away and then then handling it some more by stockpiling and reprocessing it and all that kind of thing, which helps because because that material can be put into newer asphalt mixes, but this is by far the most economical way to recycle that pavement and, and uh, make for a longer lasting new pavement over the top. Well, and also with the pulverization, it, it pays to look at the, if you're doing like an employee parking lot or a front lot at a facility, you know, the, the pulverization process is, is raising all that material, you're taking your asphalt and you're actually bringing everything right. up probably an inch or so higher than what you've got. So then your asphalt needs to be placed on top of that. So it's important to look at the drainage, look at the perimeter. Do you have curb and gutter or is it something that just sheets drains off into a grassy area? If you don't have a lot of restrictions, pulverization is an excellent option. And even if you do have some restrictions, you have some perimeter curb and gutter or you have some islands, a lot of times if you look at how Mike referenced, everything stays there. There's no exporting, there's no milling, there's none of that activity that's expensive. So sometimes it's more cost effective to actually replace the curb and gutter, raise that up to match the new grades, it improves your drainage, and it, as Mike mentioned, gives you a much beefier, lower material underneath that asphalt that is gonna give you longevity. And Mike, you mentioned that pulverization is kind of a form of recycling. What other types of um, recycling can be done on a paving project? Sure. Um, so when we talk about recycling, um, there's two ways to look at it. I mentioned the first one, and that is recycling the pavement that you have. We talk about pulverization. I mentioned milling, and then taking that, we call it we call it reclaimed asphalt uh, pavement. RAP is an acronym for that, and the contractor will haul away, they'll stockpile it, and then they'll use that. That can be blended into a brand new asphalt mix and uh, still have a high quality performing performing mix. So there's that kind of recycling. There's other forms, <clears throat> excuse me, there's other forms of recycling where we can put other products other than asphalt into our mix and our asphalt mixtures and common uh, type of, of recycling product would be like asphalt shingles, uh, spent shingles from roofs, there's two types spent, and then there's the, um, the one-offs from the manufacturing facility that haven't been oxidized that, that can be used. Um, usually, uh, that's a pretty small amount that goes into the, uh, into the asphalt mixture, simply because the grade of asphalt that is on the shingles is a very high, high grade asphalt, because obviously the sun's beating down on it, and it's got to hold those rocks in there. So it changes, it changes the, the performance makeup of the asphalt oil that's in, that we're putting into the mix. And... Uh, so shingles is one way to do it. Uh, the asphalt itself, glass uh, has been recycled into asphalt uh, mixtures. Um, tires, which we refer to as crumb rubber, you might have heard the, the term crumb rubber asphalt, where that's introduced into it. I would caution, though, uh, it's not like busting up a bunch of Pepsi bottles and then just chucking them into your asphalt mix and using it. Um, that the thing that you have to remember about asphalt and even concrete. These are, these are highly engineered materials, and anything that goes into the product, we have to know what it is and, and what its effect is going to be on the long-term performance of the pavement. So uh, glass, uh, the last project that I was on uh, was a long time ago in Iowa, uh, was a walking trail, and we were introducing glass to the mix. The glass was, was pulverized almost like to a sand. So um, the amount that went in there, the, the, uh, the size of material, um, really didn't play a big major effect on, on the performance of the, of the material. And the application was such that obviously there wasn't going to be heavy loading, it was gonna be foot and bicycle tra traffic and that kind of thing. So there's places to do that. Crumb rubber is used in, in roadway, highway, um, um, streets, residential areas, uh, parking lots, that kind of thing. But that too also has to be processed, and it gets it gets processed into a into a fine grade uh, material where it's consistent and 
and then we have known application rates for adding uh, rubberized asphalt. So if it's available in the area, it's a great, and you're looking for more recycling opportunities in promoting green and keeping stuff out of our landfills and that kind of thing, it's a great, it's a, it's a great thing to look into and talk to your, uh, to your engineer, your designer. So hey, just one quick hit as well, just sort of some recycling when it comes to the concrete side. Um, concrete mixes, there isn't the option to add all the different things like Mike was referencing. But keep in mind, um, if you're doing a construction project and that concrete is leaving the site, um, make sure it's going to a processing plant. It can get crushed back down, recycled, and turned into a crushed aggregate base course, as well as finding out from the contractor if that recycled base course from concrete is available to use as aggregate base on your project. It's more cost effective and it is a recycling aspect of reusing a great product. Plus, there are benefits to the crushed concrete in lieu of virgin aggregate materials because the concrete still has some cementitious to it. So actually once it's graded, watered and compacted, it will actually kind of stiffen up and potentially be a little more solid and locked in place than a standard virgin aggregate mix would be. I might also add uh, too, you know, if um, your organization is looking for lead points from the U.S. Green Build uh, um, environmental uh, lead is leadership and engineering and, and environmental designs and recycling is a is a big part of that. And so, you know, that may be another reason why you're, you're looking at doing more recycling with the products that you have on site. So you've mentioned pulverization and different recycling methods, which are both you know, great ways to reduce um, the need for new material to be brought in. But I also know there's a thing called perpetual per, perpetual pavements. Can you describe that a little bit and how that works? Yeah, and it's my favorite topic because I've, I've, I've talked about this all over the country in my, in my career. And uh, perpetual pavement is a, is a name that's given to uh, a pavement for the most part that is deep enough that pushes all that, that it can handle all the stress and strains, pushes all of the deficiencies up to the surface where it can be managed as, uh, as you know, either crack filling and, and um, mill and fills and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so uh, what they found out, it started in like 2000s when the, the technical phrase of perpetual pavement came around. But what they found through a number of studies was that deep, what they call deep strength asphalt, asphalt that was placed deep enough showed less strain and wear and tear towards the bottom of the, of the pavements, which meant the pavements were lasting longer. And, you know, when, when you have enough fatigue at the bottom and it starts cracking, uh, you don't know that that's happening until it manifests itself to the surface. And then you got to crack and then you're, then you're fighting it. But by then it's, it's too late. So the idea is that if we design and construct the pavement, appropriately so the big key is constructing the pavement appropriately um, uh, to the depth that we know is going to carry the traffic that it's going to be designed for then all those strains and stresses should be pushed to the surface and um, and you also you need to understand that asphalt ages the way asphalt ages it ages from the top down if if all those strains are pushed to the surface then oxidation uh, the, the weathering and the beating and the wearing and tearing shall be limited to the surface. That way we can manage it uh, and simply with, uh, with the crack ceiling and, and the mill and overlay. And you know, um, if, you, if anyone wants to learn more about perpetual pavements, it's a very interesting question that was asked, but um, Benchmark actually just republished an article yesterday. Um, so Hopefully you got our little QR codes or whatever those are called. So go check out Jason's page or mine because I just shared an article that uh, Jason actually wrote um, on perpetual pavement yesterday. So there's more information there too about how you can um, save money and reduce the downtime. It's another, it, it's another example of also uh, saving natural resources because that main structure remains intact indefinitely. All you're doing is, is milling and replacing the, the, the surface lift, and that should be lasting you anywhere between 18 and 22 years. Well, and as Elise mentioned, you know, saving time. The initial investment and the initial construction project to get all that in place is time consuming, but once it's done, you can, like Mike said, mill out the top couple inches, and during that entire operation, with the exception of when you're paving, your truck traffic is still moving back and forth, your employees are still accessing the area, everything is still yeah. operational. 
it's just that small window of time that you need for that final surface course to um, pretty much cure out is all you need. So Jason, earlier we talked about geogrid, geofabric, but there's another type of fabric out there. And this person is asking, how do fabrics and paving mats help the pavement structure? Um, okay, so typically a paving mat would be used in that overlay process that we've kind of touched on a little bit before. So if you kind of envision an existing parking lot, something that we can't really change grades on or anything, and we've got, as Mike mentioned, you know, the top couple inches is oxidized and cracked, you mill off those, those two and a half, maybe three inches, and then you install a leveling course so that it's smooth and new surface. And then this paving mat, they call it, is kind of a fiberglass product that goes on top of that new, say, inch layer of leveling course and then gets topped with two inches of surface course. And what that mat will do is you apply pretty much the straight AC binder that's in the asphalt mix itself, and then the fabric goes on top of that. Then when the second lift, that surface course goes on, it sucks that oil up through that fiberglass fabric, and that creates a waterproof barrier. So it prevents any water from coming up from your lower levels, but more importantly, as that asphalt cracks on the surface, it prevents that water from getting down into those lower layers of asphalt and down into the aggregate base. Um, because similar to concrete, as your concrete's gonna crack. Um, asphalt will crack as well. The difference is it's going to crack wherever it wants to, and it being a flexible pavement is less likely to crack as compared to concrete. But with this fabric in between these layers, regardless of what the asphalt does for cracking, you've prevented that water from getting in lower courses. Um, it is a very, you know, contractor specific, qualified contractor to do this type of work. It's not something that any average contractor can do. There's requirements, there's training, there's things like that that are needed, as well as making sure you're using the right materials. You know, we've kind of touched on that before. Materials are key, whether it's pavement marking or whether it's oils or whether it's fabrics, everything is very key to making sure you're using the right material. And sometimes um, with fabrics in particular, it can kind of slow down the, um, slow down the project a little bit because a lot of times, like Jason said, it's a subcontractor that has to come in or a specialty contractor that has to come in. And so typically if a fabric has been specced, there's a reason why it's been specced. Um, and so that's just something to think about as well, because there, there are contractors that, you know, they're trying to make money too. They want to get in and get out and get the project done. And a lot of times it's another layer um, because of the special resources and, and um, machinery that's needed to install some of the fabrics. Well, and there is, there is the upcharge to installing the fabric, obviously, but you're already in the middle of the construction project. And if you have the asphalt that some of that cracking in the lower level after you've milled it out needs to be kind of slowed and prevented from coming up into the new surface, that's what that fabric will do. So when you're looking at the structural overlay and you're concerned, you know, how solid is my existing asphalt base, this is another insurance policy you can invest in that will help that overlay last a little bit longer for you know, another 10 or 15% more than the overlay cost would be in itself. So Troy, this next question is kind of talking about the construction phase. And they're wondering, what do your field observers most often identify as incorrect during construction? Um, that's a, when I do uh, inspections or construction oversight, especially in concrete, when we're ripping out the old concrete, the wire mesh and the reinforcement, nine times out of 10 is at the bottom of the concrete. Um, it's always spec that those wire meshes and those reinforcing steels should be in the center of the concrete. But during construction, they never have enough uh, support chairs underneath that mesh. The, contract, the workers walk on that mesh while they're installing the concrete, it pushes it down, and even though you see them grab it with their rakes and try to pull it up, it always ends up on the bottom of the concrete where it does no good. Concrete has compressive strength, but very little tensile strength, and that's what that steel is for. So I see that all the time where um, that steel is not installed properly in the concrete. And, Construction inspection and observation is the weak link in any construction project. It doesn't matter how good of a design uh, someone puts together, if the contractor doesn't follow the specs, doesn't 
install the right materials, that was a waste of time and a waste of money. So um, I'm a big advocate of uh, inspection and observation to make sure that the specifications are adhered to to assure that that pavement is going to last as long as it was designed for. And you know, Ben, well, I think you um, asked, sorry, Jason, um, I think you asked about what do we see when we're on site and I don't do construction observation at Benchmark, uh, but I've read a lot of reports and proofed a lot of them over the years. And um, I think, you know, a lot of things I've seen come through in those reports are the submittals. You know, you may have an approved list of submittals and the wrong, wrong products are being brought to the site. And sometimes it's a true oversight. Maybe it's um, the general contractor not sharing with the subcontractor the list of um, approved submittals or maybe it's a different form in that day or whatever but there's a lot of times where we see the wrong fabrics the wrong asphalt concrete being brought to the site and all of that there was a reason that those items were specced and there was a reason that that submittal was requested so i think that's also something that we see yep as well as inconsistencies in what the sectional depths are you know, we've designed it for four inches of asphalt, eight inches of aggregate base underneath, and you start excavating out a failed pavement and you see that, you know, they only put down two or three inches of aggregate in certain areas, or I've actually watched and done a removal of an adjacent concrete and, and watched the concrete fluctuate up and down. So, you know, they're just not doing the due diligence needed to ensure that that asphalt is going down at, you know, two lifts at four inches or that concrete's going in at six or eight inches and things like that so it's it's critical to make sure you get what you're paying for for one thing as well as making sure that you know things are properly put to grade it, it needs the right thickness for many reasons and as troy mentioned things have got to be placed where they belong absolutely and you know troy i wonder if you should share some insight you might be the best one to share some insight on some of the post-construction audits that you've been involved with and some of the stuff that you've seen there because again we're not on site but it's things that maybe we're finding out after the fact for some of our clients. Yeah, we do. Sometimes we do post-construction inspection. Uh, when the project's done, we go out, we inspect the pavement for uh, workmanship to make sure everything was completed um, from a, a visual standpoint. But we also measure the area that was paved. And uh, by knowing the thickness that was required, we can do some calculations and figure out how many tons of asphalt were required to pave that area with say two inches of, of material. And then we can, then we, what we do is we request the, uh, the load tickets that the contractor received from the asphalt plant that were delivered to the site. And we compare the total tons of asphalt that the contractor said was used to what our calculations are. And many times we find out that um, these pavements, do, there's not enough material delivered to assure that there was a, a full thickness of asphalt installed. And, and in some cases, that's thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, which we do get credits for our customers on that. But the real shame of it is, is they've got a deficient pavement that is not going to last the 15 to 20 years that they were hoping for. And in the long run, they end up re reconstructing it sooner than they should have. So, um, you know, we do post-construction audits, but we'd much rather be there to make sure it's installed properly to begin with. Yeah, and a lot of times we don't see the overall impact, you know, so the client gets a credit back on the maybe shortage of material, but you don't see the overall impact within that one year time frame, which is kind of the um, industry standard for a warranty. So if you don't see those deficiencies within that one year, then you've kind of lost out on the warranty period. And then that's when your pavements are going to, what we would classify as premature failure. So there's times where maybe um, the site was just redone six, seven years ago, we're asked to go out and evaluate it. And we see that we would classify it as a premature failure because based on the time frame in which it was installed, it should be performing a lot better. And so then you kind of have to dig in years later to figure out what happened. So it's really good to be proactive um, and be on top of that during the construction phase of the project. Troy, this next question I'm going to give to you, and they're asking, um, you know, borings or geotechnical exploration can be costly. Why is it a necessity? Um, the reason geotechnical or boring of your asphalt and getting a geotechnical report during the design phase is invaluable because you can design a pavement based on past experience or what you think but unless you have hard data, it, it's really difficult to come up with a proper design. And, and what those borings give us for information is 
the thickness of the pavements. Uh, it lets us know if maybe there's concrete under the type of pavement. There might be concrete under your asphalt uh, that you don't know about. It gives us the thickness and makeup of the base courses. And then it also tells us the makeup of the subgrade materials, whether they're clays or sub uh, uh, sands and gravels. But then the other thing that we get from our boring or geotechnical reports is uh, moisture content, which you know can help us determine whether we need to um, add some kind of drainage system for the subgrade water to keep that away from the pavement system, keep it dry so it doesn't fail prematurely. So although borings and coring, you know, geotechnical reports seem expensive in the scope of the whole construction project uh, to assure that you're getting a proper design, it's not really that expensive. Well, and I think, Troy, also um, what we've seen with geotech is if we're able to do the geotech during the design phase or sometimes even during the assessment phase, one, we can fine tune the budget just a little bit better. And two, we're, uh, it helps us to be able to build in those contingencies during construction because no client ever has been happy about a change order that's come up during the construction phase of their project. So spending that little bit of money up front for the geotechnical work during the design phase will, I think, really help in reducing the overall um, unexpectancies and change orders during the construction phase of the project. Well, there was one project that I was involved with that did that exactly. We pretty much had um, a large employee parking lot in the front and it was failing, but it was failing from the bottom up. We did the, the drilling and everything and knew there was between 12, 10 and 12 inches of aggregate base, but that wasn't enough to support on the weak subgrades, but the aggregate base was a high quality product. So we actually removed the asphalt, then we salvaged all of that aggregate base, fixed the subgrade, did the fabrics, and then reused all of that aggregate base. And by the time we reused all of that base, the cost for the borings was minimal compared to what they saved in the overall project, just because we knew there was enough there to design that. Had we seen, you know, three or four inches of aggregate, well, then we knew that was the, you know, the culprit, the part of the failures. But um, so that alone saved the project hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sure. You know, Troy and I had a situation earlier this year, Jason, where we were working on a project together and we had done an assessment at the site, put together preliminary budgets based on a roadway needing to be redone. And um, the owner had given us the kind of the record document information for the work that had taken place. And so kind of looking at that or having a general idea of what was there, um, once we did the geotech and put together the design, it doubled the cost of our project. So then we had to go back to the client and say, well, instead of telling you that it's gonna be $400,000, it's actually going to cost 800000 because when we did this geotechnical work, it didn't match up with what was in the documents that were provided to us. And we would have had no way of knowing that. So without that geotechnical, yeah, it was sticker shock for the clients and we had to uh, scale the project back. But at the same time, better to find it out up front than during the construction phase. As a, and as another example of a contractor didn't build that roadway per the plans and specs 10 years earlier. So 10 years later, that, that pavement had failed under the loading and uh, needed full reconstruction. Well, we have about three minutes left and we're gonna go all the way to the end to make sure you get your money's worth. But if you have any last questions, feel free to get those submitted. As I mentioned, we will follow up with any questions we don't have time for to make sure that the, answers are, the questions are answered. And so the last question I'm going to give to you, Mike, and they're asking, what is QAQC? What does it mean and how does it impact the project? You bet. Uh, actually, QCQA is, is how it's labeled. Uh, it's an acronym for Quality Control, Quality Assurance. And this has a lot to do with why it's important to have uh, construction phase oversight. Um, Everything that we said here today, we're not, we're not putting the blame heavily on and solely on contractors. And if you've ever been out on a project, some are pretty straightforward, others can be very complex and have a lot going on. And when you're lacking the oversight, things happen. You know, some, some corners get cut, uh, maybe some mistakes get buried, that kind of thing. But it's always good to have somebody out there. So QCQA is, um, is a really part of the contract that sets uh, has the contractor uh, set a plan for uh, control uh, functions of almost just about every facet of I'm just going to pick an asphalt project okay uh, there are control procedures that can be planned for 
uh, the mix design for the uh, plant itself and, and loading into a truck, uh, hauling the material to the, to the construction site can have a, a con control plan. And uh, the lay down process, the compaction process, we talked about density and how important that is uh, to our payments and, and whatnot. Um, so that's the quality control side of it. And, and it's, it's a very important, very key facet to what you're trying to do. Because you want to you build what you've designed, right? The quality assurance part of that is where you've got, the, that's the oversight part of it, where you've got a, a third party or somebody that's looking out for the interest of the customer then that can oversee that and there are it built into the contract there are there are not only the control factors but there's the assurance factors how, how can I assure that that's happening so there are some test results some reporting that need to happen a, a classic one is for the mix design okay uh, the contractor is, is constantly testing those mixes for all the volumetrics that it was designed to have gradation oil content air voids uh, all of that specific gravity, all of that, all those kinds of things that are in the contract. Uh, the quality assurance part of that would be where Benchmark, who's overseeing the project, then every 750 tons we take a sample and we ship it to a separate lab, and that's already been predetermined. But we ship it to a separate lab, and we also have that lab test for the volumetrics to make sure that everything is in correlation. So it just keeps everybody on their toes, and um, and it just gives us a better insurance that uh, that what we're asked for, what we designed for, is actually being delivered and being placed, and and uh, better end product all the way around. All right. Well, Mike, Troy, Elise, and Jason, thank you for joining me for this discussion today, and thank you to everybody that was able to attend. But I will be following up with an email with everybody's contact information. Feel free to ask us any more questions you might have. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank right. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.